welcome our speaker, Christine Casey, who is the, among many things, she's the current CEO of the Chinook Sexual Assault Center, and she's going to address issues of child abuse. Christine. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to have with me here today Michelle Montgomery, who is our board chair for the Chinook Sexual Assault Center, and uh, one of the originating board members who actually saw the center come to fruition in the city of Lethbridge. Uh, so today, we are going to talk about something that's sometimes a little difficult for people to, to hear about, and that is about uh, child abuse. Uh, so I know that there may be people here in this room that have experienced it, or know of people, love people that have experienced it or are supporting someone currently. And we know sometimes just hearing that children get harmed uh, can be dysregulating for people. So we really want you to take a few minutes if you need it. Uh, these are some, if you know about QR codes, okay, it was a young staff who designed that. Uh, uh, but you can tap onto the QR codes, but there are some wonderful grounding exercises and breathing exercises you can do. If you don't do that, and if you just need to take a break, it's really okay. I'll only be offended if the whole room walks out at one time. So that was a joke. <laughs> so uh, it's really equally important not just to talk about this topic but to make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. I'm trying to do this so I can see my notes. It's the problem with progressive uh, lenses. Some of you may know uh, that we are still a very young agency. We're actually, come January, will be our fifth anniversary of being open to the public. So we offer crisis support, uh, system navigation, peer support groups, police and court support, counseling, public education, and our newest program, the Chinook Child Youth Advocacy Centre, which you'll hear a little bit about. Close to 20 years ago, I was one of uh, three people from three different organizations that actually decided we need to do more than just poster campaigns to talk about uh, sexual abuse in our community. So we formed what's called the Sexual Violence Action Committee, which remains in place today. So we look at those pathways that didn't exist before, what those gaps are in services, and the things that we need to do. And from this is actually, where a lot of the work came to actually establish the Chinook Sexual Assault Center. So when we fast forward to today, we have that, plus we have our new program, the Chinook Child Youth Advocacy Center. In a nutshell, we exist because sexual violence has not gone away and remains one of the only violent crimes in Canada that continues to increase in this past decade. And unlike the myths that have been um, supported throughout the years, sexual assault, sexual abuse, rape, uh, whatever term you give it, is not about sex or attraction. It is motivated by power and control, and is a crime of violence against a person's body and will. Sexual assault perpetrators test, groom, target victims, and use psychological and physical tactics to victimize individuals. So why this topic right now? Uh, in the province of Alberta, the month of October is actually Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here at SACPA to talk about this issue. So recently, the Sexual Assault Centre uh, renovated a space downtown Lethbridge to accommodate the needs of the Chinook Child Needs Advocacy Centre, a program that provides a coordinated multidisciplinary approach in a safe, comfortable, and culturally appropriate environment for abused children and youth and their non-offending family members. So this talk is going to explore the prevalence of child sexual abuse, long-standing implications of abuse when left unaddressed, and why it's important as a community to take action. That's my exercise as I get to dip, just yell. All right, so a little about the Child Youth Advocacy Center. So what we do at Chinook. So this center is based on 40 years of history. It's been well evaluated and well researched. It started in Alabama in the US and has a multidisciplinary approach that involves police services, social services, health, and at the time of the disclosure, significantly reduces trauma impacts to the child by streamlining processes. A CAC or the, uh, the child and youth may end up having to tell their worst story, their truth about what's happened to them over and over and over again between police, social services, uh, doctors, whoever that might be. This helps them tell their story just once in a controlled setting with a trained child forensic interviewer and that information can be used in court and where the child only has to then be cross-examined if it's done well. Again, they only have to tell their story the one time the more times a child tells their story, the more traumatized they become. And for families, it means that they are sometimes left navigating a very daunting criminal justice system and trying to find those needed resources for their kids. And with a Child Needs Advocacy Centre, 
we're able to coordinate all those services with the multidisciplinary approach. We can do the assessment right there for needs with the family, because quite often if the offender is the main breadwinner in the household, they may be left without emergency needs like groceries and gas to even get to the centre, that we can supply those. We can do a needs assessment, see if they're precariously housed, whatever it is that they may need, and we start to do those assessments with the child on what they really need to address their trauma, because one size does not fit all when it comes to therapy. So we help them navigate this whole system. We walk with them through the investigative and judicial process, all the way through to the completion of court. When we first started this process, we committed to building capacity in our region. What we found out in our feasibility study is that we had no one south of Calgary that was fully trained as a child forensic interviewer. So we managed to get 18 people trained between Blood Tribe uh, Police Services, Blood Tribe Child Protective Services, South Region Children's Services, Lethbridge Police Services, Tabor Police Services, I'm forgetting someone in there, uh, Pagani Child and Family Services. We also know that just getting the training on how to be a child forensic interviewer isn't enough. So we've set up a peer review process with experts in this province that helps them actually hone those skills so they can do the best by these kids. We now have an evidence-based treatment group going that's led by Dr. Kate Schwarzenberger to help create those pathways to other treatment services in our region. So people are using what is considered evidence-based treatment for kids. Uh, many may still use play therapy, which is great, but it's not evidence-based, it's not all research for that. It may not be the type of treatment that kids actually need when they're recovering from trauma. So our Neuroboy Center deals with sexual abuse uh, throughout our region. We also deal with the top 10% of cases of physical abuse and neglect. For the focus of this talk, though, we're going to be focusing more on child sexual abuse. So many of you may wonder why we need a Child Needs Advocacy Centre to begin with. So we're going to take a little dive in and, and take a look at this. So what we know, and I'm going to apologize first, I didn't update the stats. So just so you know, what we've dealt with in this last year alone was 566 crisis calls at the Chinook Sexual Assault Centre, 164 children at the Child Needs Advocacy Centre, and between the two centres, we actually supported 276 children just, you know, in one year, in a 12 month period. What we know about child sexual abuse is through provincial research that was done by the Association of Alberta Sexual Assault Services and released to the public in January of 2020. It concluded that approximately 45% of Albertans had experienced some form of sexual abuse in their lifetime. Nearly one in two. Of the adult survivors that were surveyed, 75% had their first experience of sexual abuse as children. So doing the math, it resulted in a 34% prevalence rate of child sexual abuse in the province. When we're nearing a million population for children in our province, that means about 325,000 kids that could be experiencing sexual abuse. If we look at the city of Lethbridge alone, that's about 6,800 children. The survey found that certain demographic groups even had higher incidence rates of sexual abuse. People who are Indigenous, people with diverse sexual orientations, and people living with a disability, be it an intellectual disability or a physical disability. So child abuse and neglect, and other adverse childhood experiences like ACEs, can also have tremendous impact on lifelong health, opportunity, and well-being if left untreated. For example, it increases the risks of injury, future violent victimization, and perpetration, substance abuse, delayed brain development, lower educational attainment, and limited employment opportunities. In fact, if trauma is not addressed early in life, the child is 26 times more likely to become homeless at some point in their lifetime. 30% less likely to graduate from high school, four times more likely to be arrested as a youth, and four times more likely to have suicidal ideation or other mental health needs. A more recent study out of Australia demonstrated exposure to childhood sexual abuse was related to clear increases in risks of later mental health problems. These included suicidality and depression, as well as anxiety disorders, conduct, antisocial uh, personality disorder, and substance use. This association from age 16 to 25 years persisted after taking account of other adverse factors in, the child, in their childhood, such as physical abuse, problematic parent-child uh, attachment, parental histories of illicit drug use. There was no significant association between child sexual abuse and the family's socioeconomic status. While physical abuse was also related to a range of mental health disorders for kids, including suicide attempts, the long-term effects of child sexual abuse 
were generally larger than the long-term effects of physical abuse. Overall, children exposed to sexual abuse had rates of mental health disorders, including suicidality, that were 2.4 times higher than children who were not exposed to sexual abuse. Childhood sexual abuse is associated with a broad array, array of, adverse, of adverse consequences for survivors throughout their lifetime. As a result of the more vigorous research studies in our field, our understanding of the impacts of childhood sexual abuse is becoming more nuanced, and a robust body of research evidence now clearly demonstrates the link between child sexual abuse and the spectrum of adverse mental health, social, sexual, interpersonal, and behavioral, as well as physical health consequences. To date, the strongest links have been found between child sexual abuse and the presence of depression, alcohol and substance use, eating disorders for women survivors, and anxiety disorders related for male survivors. An increased risk of re-victimization of survivors has also been demonstrated, which we talked about earlier, that of the 74% that, uh, that reported being abused, that most of them had their first experience of abuse, of sexual abuse, as a child. Imagine if we could eliminate sexual abuse, or at least provide a meaningful intervention to reduce or eliminate the impact of that trauma. We could stop future victimization. How sad is it that when a child is sexually abused, that now they have the very likely chance of being abused again? It's one of the top predictors of later abuse in life. This is why the Chinook Child Youth Advocacy Center was developed. This is why it is a program of the Chinook Sexual Assault Center. Quite often when parents are coming in with their kids for the child forensic interview, we have parents tell us about their victimization that happened when they were children. The Sexual Assault Center will meet with the parents. At our center, police arrive in plain clothes. They lock up their weapons. We do a transference of trust from, from the staff who gets the child prepared for the child forensic interview, answering the questions of what's going to happen, getting the little ones to use their big voices so they can be heard clearly, and transferring that trust then to the police officer or the social worker who's going to be doing that, that interview. We have a monitoring room, so if it's another social worker that needs to sit in to actually get the notes that they need for their file, but they're in another room so they get the information at the same time and again, reducing how many times that child has to tell their story. So our job is really to reduce trauma and increase safety by providing a welcoming, child-friendly space where additional system uh, trauma and re-victimization is minimized by limiting the number of times that child must repeat what's happened to them. We provide nurturing support for parents and caregivers and families and we provide early and seamless access to services and ensuring that the child and family has adequate support and follow-up so they know every step along the way what's going to be happening. And we hopefully increase convictions of offenders because there's clarity in the tape. We've now been fitted for remote testimony, so when approved by the court, the child does not have to even go to the court. Our courtrooms in southwestern Alberta are much like our airport, two gates. You're going to run into the person who abused you. You might run into their supporters. How intimidating is that for a little person? For any person? So we know if we don't take steps to address the trauma, that there is loss potential. There is a great risk of future victimization. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the movie Spotlight, um, which chronicled the abuse in the Catholic Church where priests were removed and sent place to place. Uh, this was uh, followed what Boston Globe had, had done in uncovering that story. There's a lawyer in that movie that was talking, who was there to provide support to the children. And he said, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to abuse one. For me, that line really resonated, because we all have actions that we can take to help stop this, to help intervene, and to help. And we don't have to be perfect to be helpful. So we each hold a responsibility to our society, to our children, to take steps to end abuse, to take steps to address abuse by addressing abuse and reducing those impacts of trauma. We create the investment in that child's future, in our collective future. We can increase school success. We can reduce homelessness. We can reduce drug addiction. 
We can ensure a capable and vibrant workforce and intervene in a manner that helps to reduce the potential for future abuse. Because remember, being abused as a child, the greatest indicator that you'll be abused again. And this takes our center and it takes all of you. We need to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, with the horrible truths that exist in our world. Those being that children are being abused, not always by strangers, but more than likely by people that they know and even have trusted in their lives. Parents, siblings, other relatives, coaches, teachers, clergy, and the list goes on. Remember, these abuses are perpetrated by a few people. Mostly men, but women also abuse. And they are typically serial offenders. Meaning, there aren't many, but those few do a great deal of harm as a serial perpetrator. I know if I could have a superpower, I want that radar where I could spot them. But they are hard to find. They hide in the veil of secrecy, knowing more times than not victims will not be believed. That victims will bear the brunt of shame and blame for the abuse and the assaults. Because we've done a great job at perpetuating what we call rape myths and spreading significant misinformation about this crime. We question what someone was wearing, if they took a ride with someone, if they were alone with the perpetrator, and you know, how could parents just trust anyone with their kid? Like the magic of background checks is going to save us. The list just goes on. So, what actions can we take? The first one is to get informed. It costs us no money to get informed. But we can listen, we can read, we can watch credible sources on child abuse and the impacts that it has on kids and families and communities and societies. This doesn't happen to one person, it happens to us all. Information is the cornerstone to change in our society. Awareness raising, education helps to build child safe cultures. Action number two, we can call out rape myths. So again, this costs no money, but take some strategy and openness to being uncomfortable. Call out the myths that perpetuate this crime. When you see them in a movie or a show or you hear it in a song or a conversation over coffee, or maybe it's written in a news article that you saw. Or the coach, maybe, that uses sexualized language or dehumanizing language. We need to call these things out, and we can do it politely. We can reframe it. We do that all the time. I still have words from the 1970s that just end up in my, in a sentence that I shouldn't use them in. And it's really okay for someone to say, you know, we don't use that term anymore because it's actually disrespectful. And that's all we need to do. Right? Some people may argue with you. Most people will be grateful that they were informed. But we need to do this. The police did a really great job yesterday at their news conference when someone asked them if this was a hazing incident. And they said, no, it's a crime. Because it is a crime. Let's not diminish what is happening. They did a great job with that. But that helps to educate others. I'm going to do a shameless promotion of an event. For those of you who are saying, I don't really know what a rape myth is, you can learn. And it's a free event. Happening next Thursday and Friday at the Sandman Hotel in Mary McGrath between 11 and, I want to say, 5 or 8, I think, on the Thursday and uh, 9 to uh, 3 on the Friday. What Were You Wearing is an event that actually originated, again, out of the U.S., but it has gone all over the world. And we're putting up outfits that were not worn by victims, uh, but outfits, outfits like they wore with their story beside. So one might be a pair of trunks and a t-shirt, and it was a male leader from our community, who visited Park Lake, now a grandfather. And that's what you see on the walls. And it's to generate that conversation about what rape myths are and how we fed into this over the years and what we can do to change it. So it's a community conversation. We welcome anyone over the age of 13 to attend. Uh, there'll be a few little snacks, but there'll be some activities for people to do as well. But you're welcome to walk in at any time to come and see that. So action number three is to be an active bystander. So we know that there are times we can intervene when we see something or we hear something that just isn't right. Just last week I read an article of a man sexually abusing a 13-year-old on a flight. So 
someplace in the States, I think it was. Uh, there was another woman in the next seat who woke up and saw his hand between this little girl's legs. When she woke up, she actually took action, she intervened, called him out, uh, moved the child so that uh, she was in between uh, him and her, and that was great. Sometimes you might be really uncomfortable or feel unsafe to do something that direct, but she could have done things like spill her coffee on them. Call, seriously, it's a distraction. That's all you need sometimes is a distraction. Sometimes with young people, we say if you're at a party and you see someone is you know, really intoxicated and you can see someone trying to guide this person to another room, you know what's gonna happen. You know in your gut what's gonna happen. You run up and say, yeah, we found that tampon that you need. Grosses people out, you intervene. It's indirect. But there's lots of ways that we can intervene as bystanders that are safe for us to do, that either take direct action, indirect action, or call for help. Get to know what those things are so that you can actually help with that when it's uncomfortable. Sometimes, even on the bus, if you're taking public transit, it might be moving so that you're next to the person who's being harassed. So that you just put a buffer in there. Our fourth action, when someone trusts you enough to tell you about their abuse, believe them. Very few people will lie about sexual abuse and sexual assault. There is a far greater harm to be done by not believing. I often ask people why they think they're an investigator. Why do you think this person needs to be worthy of your belief? Or a worthy victim, a real victim? Believe them. It takes a lot of courage to tell someone. A lot of courage to tell them. Believe them. It's not for you to investigate. It's for you to support. There's an enormous privilege when we are trusted in that moment. To share a truth so painful. Believe them. I believe you are the best words, and I think they are words that supersede the strength of the words I love you. Five minutes, we're almost done. Your next action is to become trauma aware. You've heard me talk about trauma, the cause, and the outcome of abuse if it's left unaddressed. The fifth action, learn about trauma. This helps to understand what people are experiencing or what they have experienced, why they may be intoxicated downtown Lethbridge, why they may be homeless in Lethbridge why they may be suffering from some mental health challenges. We can approach everyone that we meet in a trauma-aware way. There's a number of free and very credible resources available. Our world has changed. We know more now than what we did 15 years ago about trauma. We never used to even talk about it. I look at my friend Michelle with that. You are here today for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's the good food that LSCO has. Maybe it's a good company. You're seeing your friends again. Maybe you just want to know more. And, but here's a way that you can expand your knowledge that can be really helpful in your day-to-day -day life, no matter what trauma people have experienced. Action number six is to trust your instinct. I've already confessed to not having that superpower to be able to identify abusers, but there are times we get that feeling, that, that pinging in our gut that says something isn't right. Those times, a person of authority that has no business texting your child, your grandchild, making personal contact, or you know, if I'm gonna pick on coaches, we've had lots about sports in the news, uh, or an older relative that maybe trying to have lots of personal and private time with, with a child, we need to ask those questions. We say, yeah, you keep texting my kid, why is this? Um, what's making you want to have private one-on-one -on -one time with my kid, my grandkid? Who's texting you right now? That phone is pinging a lot. What's going on? We need to make ourselves open and aware and create that situation where kids feel safe to come and tell us. And I'll tell you, from the Sexual Assault Center, we've had a lot of grandparents bring in grandparents <coughs> to come and see us. And it was the grandparent that they told. It's pretty magical that you're that safe person to go to. <coughs> Lastly, our seventh action is to reach out for support and to offer support to your local agencies like the Chinook Sexual Assault Center and the Chinook Child and Youth Advocacy Center. Find out more of what we do, benefit from our trainings and our groups, and use us. If there are issues that you are facing, give us a call. Here's our contact information, which I can send out again to uh, Canute or whoever who would like to have that. But finally, I wanna thank you for creating space for us to talk about a very difficult issue of child abuse. And together, I believe we can change lives. I don't think I'd be in the field if I didn't really believe that to be true. But I want us to be that village that actually cares and takes action. And I hope you join us for that. Thank you. And uh, we'll. Uh
uh, unpack a lot of thorny issues. Thank you very much for, for a great presentation. So let's have some uh, questioners. But not all at once. <laughs> for coming and uh, oh, I'm Bev McGlatherstone. Thank you so much for coming and sh sharing the research and uh, updated information about this uh, very difficult topic and uh, speaking to it in a way that hopefully doesn't re-traumatize those who experienced any of these um, child abuse in, in, their, in their lives. I'm quite struck by the figures that you mentioned to us, especially, I think you said, that if you were sexually abused, you had 26 more, it was 26 times more times likely, more to likely end up that you would homeless. end up on the streets, homeless. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've given this presentation to the police and to city council, because I often go to city council and um, hear some of the councillors who um, don't seem to have quite the background and understanding of how people end up homeless. So I'm wondering if that's what you've done, or a plan, or have they not invited you, et cetera. Thank you. Well, I think in all fairness, in some situations, we haven't invited ourselves, because uh, I don't think it's necessarily that we wait to be invited to, to certain places. I will say very clearly with Lethbridge Police Services that we work uh, very well with them. Uh, we have very honest communication about you know, where either of us may be falling down and not necessarily doing the best that we can for people served. I have uh, confidence that they are aware of what may lead to homelessness. I think the issues that we're seeing uh, downtown Lethbridge and in cities and centres across this country is uh, remarkable and tragic. And I don't know if anyone right now really knows how they need to deal with it. The research has been done in the early days of social housing in action. Research was done, I believe, by Dr. Yale Blanchet um, and uh, another cohort of people around how people ended up homeless. And quite often, early in their lives, there were issues of significant trauma, be it sexual abuse or other forms of abuse. Uh, as for uh, City Council, they are certainly aware of us, and the City of Lethbridge has been very supportive of our build, uh, both with, uh, with, with grants. Uh, we haven't had that conversation, but we're certainly open to that, and we will be getting ourselves in front of them to hopefully have that uh, more in-depth conversation about what that is. Uh, for us, we aren't at the tail end when it's looking at the homelessness. It's really about that early intervention piece, and I would say early intervention in the truest sense, that we need to intervene when people have been abused as soon after a disclosure has happened, so we can reduce the impacts of post-traumatic stress disorder and the rest of it that hopefully don't lead then to them being early school leavers or being on the streets or, or being substance users. Uh, so that's some of the work that we need to do then with the city or with other funders as well so we can keep the, the treatment going. My name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, thank you very much, Christine, for coming to speak on this, for many people, difficult topic to even think about. Uh, my question relates to the incident at the Chinook high school and uh, the thing about hazing is uh, has been normalized for many years I think is that's part of joining the team and uh, it's never been called out or it often doesn't get called out for what it is uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about this is not obviously not an isolated in incident it's maybe an isolated incident in terms of the person getting abused, standing up and telling about it. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, that sort of culture? Okay, I'll try. I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in any of this, just so you know, so that's my disclaimer going in. Uh, but I am a helper by trade. Uh, when it comes to these things, some of the things that we've done really bad in our society is that we have allowed a culture that is uh, at times misogynistic, uh, where we grant certain power to uh, certainly to sports. We've seen the same thing with Hockey Canada, uh, with uh, gymnastics, with all sorts of sports, uh, soccer, all sorts of things that have happened uh, worldwide and locally. 
Uh, so we allow this type of power that comes, that gets ascribed to people who are in these types of positions, which are positions of authority and role modeling. We allow uh, for, um, we allow for uh, you know, very much, in some cases, a macho uh, culture that then allows this to happen. We hide behind things like saying that it's hazing rather than saying that it's a crime and calling it out. And we have a fear sometimes of calling things out that there may be a backlash. And I can tell you quite seriously, uh, even today's age is far worse than what I saw 20 years ago. Uh, the advent of uh, social media and what's happened since COVID has been nothing short of, um, I guess, I think horrific. I honestly think that social media, that nobody should have any type of, uh, be able to hide behind anything that they should have to use their name and we should know who it is that's posting so they can be held to account for what they're saying because quite often it's criminal. Um, so I think there's cultures that, that we've created and there's a lot of things that we have to deconstruct uh, in this next while for us to really make those changes. So even when you look back to, was it world soccer and the Spanish team winning and when the coach or the person from the soccer federation kissed uh, the lead person on the women's uh, Spanish soccer team, uh, there was outrage. It was so dismissed by people saying, well, how is that sexual assault? Because we expect it to be penetration for sexual assault. Sexual assault is a range of behaviors. Uh, it covers everything. And because it is a violation, there was no consent asked. Uh, he did it on a public state. I mean, it's just horrible what happened. And yet, we serve to diminish that. Like, that was acceptable, but only this again is worthy for us to talk about. It's all those instances that we need to call out and say is wrong. Uh, Knud, I mean, I, I sort of chuckled when you have to introduce yourself, because I think everyone in Lethbridge knows who's Knud, who Knud is. Um, but he came up and he said, oh, can I give you a hug? He asked for consent. And we don't laugh about that, because that's important. We teach consent from day one with our kids, right? You don't make them hug dear old Aunt Mary with the hair on her chin if, if she scares them. If the kid wants to hug her, by all means, that's great. But if not, we let the child decide. But we still have people that force these relationships, that force it and make it okay. Those are some of the issues that we're grappling with. This is not unique. This isn't a one-off. Is the other sad thing. Hockey Canada just exploded, what, a year ago? Let's not forget. How many victims were there along the path? How many other teams have we seen this with? How many other clubs have we seen this with? Not even sports teams. It's not a one-off. I don't know if that answered, I don't know if I have a magic answer right now. Hi, my Hi. name is Henning Mundel. Is the it's, it's I'm getting the mic? I'm not speak, sure. Speak into the mic. Yeah, just go yeah. closer. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, because I noticed it's danger to be too loud, too. Oh. You gave us uh, quite a few of the statistics uh, of the frequencies of, uh, um, let's say, um, undesirable outcomes for people through sexual assault and different ratios. And then you mentioned a whole bunch of um, important interventions, including information, but also just direct interventions. Mm -hmm. Are there statistics that show how people that have gone through this whole series then, that these percentages, these unwelcome percentages, were reduced? Yep. I, okay. Yep. Um, I won't be able to quote the research off the top of my head, but I will tell you about the outcome measures and how we receive the outcomes at our center. So when they are in treatment, we actually look for, if there's a reduction, there's a test that we do on the reduction of trauma symptoms that they have. Uh, there's ones that look at specifically around PTSD. Uh, there's one that's called Props and Crops. Bev might be able to talk more clearly to some of that than I can, because I'm not a therapist, that also measure the reduction of those symptoms within that. Uh, we look at what the parent and the child uh, attachment is, because quite often for the non, if, the, if there was a parent that, when a child's been abused, there's often a disconnect that happens with the attachment, an interruption of that attachment between child and, and parent. So there is work that can be done to help reattach that, uh, which again, helps with the, the child to be able to heal, the family being able to heal and move forward. So there are measurements around that that are well researched and evidence-based. So when we look at evidence-based treatment, like I mentioned earlier, all of those are, are looked at by here are the testing that we can do pre and post to show that there is movement with that. Uh, being a newer agency, what I can tell you, I happen to have brought last year's uh, report. Um, for the Sexual Assault Center, we have self-reports as well from the people that we serve. 
uh, that come in. So we had 98% reported that the worker helped develop strategies to manage their feelings. 96% uh, reported feeling calmer, less in crisis and distress after the worker uh, met with them. 93% reported having a better understanding of the services and supports that are available to them. Because again, we build resiliencies by people knowing how to tap in and how to have those help-seeking behaviors. 100% um, said that we were helpful. 91% reported having a plan of what to do next. They know what they were going to do. 93% um, reported having been supported uh, well. 100% uh, of the clients that went through counseling demonstrated a reduction in trauma impacts in their life. Uh, so we're seeing where, where this work is happening. Um, so those are the types of things that we track uh, for our center and they are tracked uh, with other centers as well, other sexual assault centers and other job youth advocacy centers. Uh, so we hope to be able to provide basically a social return on investment on what that looks like uh, for communities to know what the government is paying for, what you might be investing in as a donor. Thank you. I'm uh, Ian Hurdle. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a hard thing to talk about. It, kiss the, kiss you, the mic. It's a hard thing to talk about, but you do it very well. My question for you is: COVID has sort of turned us upside down, and it's forced people to be in more of an isolation and uh, coalesce together. Maybe not as much as they want. Has that sort of uh, really push things along in this way, causing more problems? Uh, it absolutely did, and there were certainly early news reports about the increase of domestic violence. We know domestic violence, sexual violence, is part and parcel with domestic violence quite often. So we saw that with the isolation that was happening, that people were actually held captive within their homes, and we saw abuse skyrocket. We saw kids being disconnected from their schools, so a lot of parents went to homeschooling models, and for some parents, they didn't even register them in homeschooling models. So there were literally thousands of children across this country where we didn't know where they were. And the reality is, I don't know how many of you were school teachers. Were any of you school teachers? A few of you were great. Uh, you know that you're the ears and the eyes. You know, from September to June, uh, you're, you're looking after those kids, and you're, you're the ones who do the big reports to social services or to police when you know that something's going on. So we lost track of where kids are. We didn't even know where they were. There was no way to follow up with them. We know there was an increase of online pornography. The access to pornography, I mean, the old days, you know, back in the 70s and the 80s, you had to walk down the street and go to the corner store and uh, hopefully get an older buddy to go buy you a magazine if you wanted one. There was still not healthy, but there was, you know, you had some mitigating factors there, right? Online, people have continuous access to it. The rise of the viewing of online pornography by younger children, this is their first experiences, seeing something that's really unhealthy, seeing sometimes very violent acts happening, very unnatural acts happening, and this is what they've been exposed to, which then forms what they think should be happening. That is having a grave impact on things. We saw an increase to uh, not only cyber attacks with all of our businesses and agencies, but also the sextortion and the rest of it happening with kids. Where on gaming sites, they befriend someone who they think is in Japan, who's their same age, and it's really a creepy 40 year old from Brampton, Ontario. I'm not saying that people from Brampton are creepy. That's just a, an off the side uh, comment. Um, but all of a sudden it's some 40 year old that's just wanting to get new pictures of them. They share them, and then they're threatened. They're extorted for money. They're extorted for other things around sex. They're forced into things that they don't want to be part of. So we saw that increase dramatically. Uh, and it continues to increase, increase. And I think there's a whole lot of rules that need to come around social media and gaming sites and the rest of it that we have not kept up with in Canada, in the US, or worldwide. So those have all increased uh, the risks for kids and for families. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, Bart Phillips, uh, I, this is really, you've partly answered the question just now, but I think we all remember Amanda Todd's story in, out of BC. Her perpetrator was over in the Netherlands, I believe, and she took her own life. It was, anyway, I'm just wondering, have we gotten any better at tracking down these people that uh, are doing these horrible things but she was in BC, a young teenager. He was over in the Netherlands. And 
I don't know, I guess he got sentenced, but he did not get extradited to Canada, I believe. So could you comment, are the police getting better at this stuff or is it getting worse? Unfortunately, I think it's the latter. <laughs> I think it's hard to keep up with something that's moving at a speed greater than light is one of the things. I think the police are doing everything they can within their, with, that's within uh, their ability and within the law that they can do because uh, they can't go as fast as criminals and criminals are, and uh, people who want to abuse others, highly manipulative. If there was a master's class on how to manipulate someone, just talk to an abuser. They know how to befriend you, they know how to, to, to get next to you, they know how to buddy up with a woman who has uh, three kids uh, to make her feel really pretty and welcomed and, and love happens and all of a sudden they're, they're abusing kids. Um, so I think when we look at the cyber crimes and, and what's going on, uh, we have special uh, prosecution units and we have uh, special detail units that are looking at that. If you want to check out some good research around that, looking at the Canadian Centre for Child Protection out of Winnipeg, uh, is an excellent uh, center. So they run um, arachnid.ca, uh, they run uh, cybertip.ca where people can report these crimes when they see them happening. Uh, so they are the ones that are putting out the report saying, uh, you know, this is happening more and more. They're able to do a lot of special prosecutions because some things involve the RCMP, it may not even be the local police because it is international. Uh, so they are finding them, but again, you know, criminals tend to be quicker at it, right? And our world changes uh, so much faster than what it used to, or it feels faster now. Maybe it's because I'm also uh, getting a little you know, older that I think it's changing too fast for me. Um, so I think they're doing everything that they can. There's still more that needs to be done. I can't speak exactly on if they're able to keep up at all. I think they would say they aren't, and it's really sad. We are seeing more reports happening though, which is good. And we are making it okay for kids to come forward, which is good, and that's what we need to make. Because quite often, again, they feel a lot of shame and blame for this. Uh, but we have parents now that are stopping and hearing and seeing that. The most important things that we can do as grandparents, as parents, as those aunties and uncles, as those caregivers, is to really, don't just trust they have parental controls on, because I'll tell you a six-year-old can outmaneuver me on any computer. Uh, so you need to know what they're seeing and what they're responding to and be present for that. That's the biggest thing that we can do to really help guide them with that and to have those conversations about what a real relationship is. I remember a young person who was 16 and she was in love with some guy in Wales. Well, have you ever met him? No. Okay, so what makes for a relationship? What makes for a healthy relationship? What are we modeling to these kids about what healthy relationships are? All those types of things are part of the actions that we can take as well to help reduce the impact or to help hopefully not have that happen to our children. I don't, that probably doesn't answer anything that you want to answer, but that's all I got. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Mike McKay, and <clears throat> you pretty much covered what I was going to bring up to an extent. Uh, I did uh, law enforcement for 45 years, and I did a number of these types of investigations. And I think the most predominant thing that I remember, and I do my, I've been retired a long time, the most predominant thing I remember is that in almost every case, the victim <clears throat> had told someone before we found out about it, or before they were believed. And I think that's one of the most important things that you mentioned today that we need to reinforce, especially with our group, because like you said, we're, most of us are grandparents, so we need to pay attention to what we're told and be careful that we believe. Yeah. Absolutely, and you know, law enforcement, you know, we know that there was a lot of struggles. We had the unfounded article that came out in the Globe and Mail a number of years ago, and there's been a lot of work across Canada with law enforcement agencies to look at victim advocate case reviews and how, uh, how police are being trauma-informed when they're doing those interviews, because it's very different from interviewing someone who is actually a criminal to interviewing a victim. Uh, so they've been working really hard on that. Uh, I think uh, most municipal, uh, municipal police services across Canada and the RCMP uh, for our center, along with other sexual assault centers, we are involved with the RCMP, uh, I think twice a year, going over a victim advocate case review where they bring the cases that were not cleared by charge. So even if they were deemed unfounded, they weren't cleared by a charge, so let's look at them. And we get to see all the videos, we get to see everything, and we get to give feedback to the police on what needs to improve, what could have been done differently, and maybe you need to look at this again. Uh, we are working on that uh, locally, and there certainly is that, that spirit to want to work together because and I say this knowing any agency can, can mess up, 
But I really do believe that Lethbridge Police Services uh, really wants to do a good job by, by the victims. They also want to see the bad people being held to account for what they've done. And so we're going to be as supportive in that process as what we can. But I believe you, I really will stand by those are the most important words that we can know. Um, stay calm, let them know that they're, that they're heard, take that time for privacy and reflection, and not ask a lot of questions, just let the person talk, and I believe you. And it goes a long ways, and you can just see the shoulders relax when that happens. Because quite often we see very few, and I don't know if you know what the current stats are around reporting to policing authorities, I still think it's around the 10 or 15% mark, like it's not high for people going to police. We tend to see more police reports happening when it's a stranger sexual assault that happens than when it's someone that they know. The unfortunate thing is you heard the stats are, it's usually someone that you know. And so again, they've already discounted that they're gonna be believed before they even talk to anyone. So we're on the front lines. We can all receive this uh, gratefully when someone talks to us. Alan. Hi, my name is Alan Friesen. First of all, I want to applaud Christine and her team for the amazing work they do. I mean, that's hard, hard work to do. Those emotional things that you have to, that you have experienced. So thank you so much. First of all, the question, one of your tips, which I love them. Thank you. Well, what can we do? And one of them was about being informed, being educated. And I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but through the Alberta Family Wellness Institute, they have this program, the Brain Story Certification. It's incredible, like it's really, really valuable and really makes the connection be free between adverse childhood experiences and outcomes if they don't get the support, the care, the, the nurturing they need to heal from that. So I'm just sharing that that is an amazing resource. I shared it actually with our chief, um, Shaheen Medizadeh, and I know he took the course and then has certainly been encouraging officers in, in the Lethbridge Police Force to take it as well. So an amazing resource, it's free, it's comprehensive, and it's super valuable. So thank you yeah. again, Christine. Yeah, so that, that course is actually 30, uh, 30 hours in length, really, to, to work it through. So it's very comprehensive. It's probably one of the better trainings that, that's out there, and it is free. So all you have to look up, uh, look up is uh, through the Alberta... Uh, Alberta Family Wellness Institute. There you go. Uh, to, to find that. And if there's other courses that you're interested in, just reach out to us. We'll let you know what they are. I'm going to exercise my prerogative to ask Please a question. You. Sure. Uh, you said something that I found quite disturbing, actually, and I don't know if I misheard it or not. But you were talking about, uh, uh, I believe, uh, groups that are more inclined to experience child abuse. And um, mm -hmm. if I heard it right, and you said people of diverse sexual orientation included in that group now. Uh, that's disturbing because oftentimes I think those groups are discriminated against in many ways and feared. And so I just wondered what I heard and what could elaborate on. I think what we all know in society is that there's a pecking order for who is valued and who is not valued. And what, who we see as not being valued are people of color, indigenous peoples, people with developmental disabilities, people with physical disabilities, uh, people who identify as to as LGBTQ+, uh, that they're seen as less than human. And we know the act of sexual abuse or sexual assault is predicated on really dehumanizing that person for that crime to happen. This is why they become particular targets uh, for these crimes, because we discard these human beings. We see them as less worthy in our society. That really helps for those crimes to be increased in that way. So when we talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, we also have to talk about how are our actions actually mitigating those risks of future abuse of these people. Uh, those are some of the things that, those hard conversations that we need to have. But certainly we see that with a lot of, uh, with a lot of groups, but that is some of the fundamental reasons that go into that. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, we, I think we have two more questions and then we're maybe out of time, but we'll see. Hi, Christine, it's me again. <laughs> Christine, could you talk a little bit about how our judicial system is mm -hmm. is working these days? Because uh, it's not that long ago a judge said that maybe you should just keep your knees together. Uh, are they, uh, um, is the culture around sexual assault 
in the judicial system. Do you see it changing? I think a lot of the public reports that came out, certainly through the Me Too movement, certainly through the unfounded uh, expose that happened across Canada with the Globe and Mail, uh, certainly with some of the other news reports that have happened, is calling into question a lot of things that are happening in our society from both how institutions, be it uh, sports institutions or policing institutions or the judicial system is handling sexual assault. Uh, in Canada, we always, you know, when we talk to, to victims, we talk to them that don't expect what you saw on law and order, because it's not the same judicial system in Canada as what we have in the States. Um, we know that uh, those that go to, uh, to court, there's, you know, 50% are maybe successful in some sort of conviction that's going to happen. So we still aren't seeing the type of conviction rates we want to see. When it's historic sexual abuse, it's very difficult uh, to get the evidence that you need to actually make this happen. So I know there has been movements around judges being trained on, on the issue and, and providing the information. I think there is public pressure uh, for people to be more in tune with what the issues are. I know locally our Crown Prosecutors, uh, for the most part, are in tune with what those issues are and work really hard on that. Uh, with a section, is it, I'm gonna look at uh, my friend over here, section 276 and 278 that calls into question uh, the victim's uh, past sexual history that now we have, we do have a person dedicated through Lethbridge Legal Guidance to actually support them through that process uh, to represent them as well as legal aid can provide that as well. Uh, so those are things that have been put in place uh, to help with that process. So I always have hope. I think we have a long way ahead. One's more of a comment that I want to make. Uh, when I looked after older people, when I looked after older people, some of them have been victims of young people, and they've actually not followed up or proceeded with care for cancer or other chronic problems. They just say, I'm no good anymore. Um, I don't want any care. Another, that's more of a comment. I was at meetings in the U.S. where Larry Nasser, who is uh, mm -hmm. kind of famous, um, was a keynote speaker. <laughs> and uh, so how do you deal with the people that have got a large uh, cultural presence, and uh, and how do you uh, how do you get, avoid those people from being so crafty and taking people in? <laughs> Again, I don't have that superpower. I keep telling you that. I, I wish I did. And honestly, if there is one thing I could get, I'd really want that. It's really hard. Uh, there are people that uh, probably all of us know and love and admired at one point uh, that we found out to be an abuser. And it's a really difficult thing to navigate. Um, it may not take away from some of the work that they did in the past, but it certainly taints everything that they've done. And it certainly rocks us at our core when it's someone that we may have admired. Think about what it is for a child or for another person when it's been someone within their family, someone that they trusted within their circle of trust, that acquaintance at school. It rocks your very foundation of what that is. So I think we have to be forgiving sometimes to institutions if they've done everything that they can, that we may still have an abuser within our midst. And we need to take whatever steps we can uh, legally to be able to extract that person and to call them out. We saw the same thing, the fires in Fort McMurray. Let's not forget, we, we had nothing but accolades for the fire chief who saved that town and you know saved that population. Uh, it later came out about the horrific sexual harassment that he had actually placed on a female employee to the point where she is incapable of working. You know, he, he was pushed off his white horse pretty fast with that, and thankfully so. Thankfully so. So, we'll see what's going to happen. I don't know how else to answer that either. Hard questions, thank you. This, this group is known for asking hard yeah. questions. <laughs> um, so our time is uh, evaporating. Do you have some last uh, words you want to sum, with, sum up with or uh, pearls of wisdom? Mm -hmm. Even though this month is uh, dedicated to Child Abuse Prevention Month, this is something we deal with daily monthly, annually, and for decades to come. It's not gonna go away overnight, and we really need you to be part of this journey. You are important in this community. You are important in, in your families and with, with your friends. So I really do invite you to learn more and to be able to have some of those meaningful conversations when things come up, and to integrate it into, hopefully, your daily life on what we can do. Uh, so again, I just wanna thank you uh, for this time and for this opportunity. And